Hey everybody, welcome to Bash University. Riz and I are here. Um, man, we got one of one a phenom coming on with us, Riz. We got Jay Shakuri. Yep. Uh just just so young, so successful already. Uh just an amazing angler uh with some big wins and uh looking forward to having him on. Yeah, yeah. He's a really, really talented angler, and he's also a a, a really talented instructor uh with us at the bash university as well uh we've we worked with him last year uh in athens texas and then we we did some stuff with him this year at icast and um really has a a, a strong ability to communicate and teach and uh yeah I, I can't wait to uh dive in with him a little bit about what his learning process looked like and how how he got to the point to become not only the first angler to to crack the 100 pound mark on smallmouth yep. also win rookie of the year um, and really, you know, he's, he's, he's not just a smallmouth guy. He's, he's, he's successful pretty much across the board. Well, all the places they go, uh, as always, there's always some learning curve there and there's, you know, the, the never stop learning is our motto and Jay kind of embodies that pretty good. So yeah, it's going to be fun to talk. To what are you, what are you guys doing to become better anglers? Uh, how, you know, and that's what we're going to be talking to Jay about is how, how he got to where he's at, at such a young age, uh, jumping, jumping that learning curve and, uh, you know, we'll talk about the things that we've done and and have been successful to help us uh, grow. And what are you guys doing? What do you want to learn this year? And um, that's what that's what the, the theme of today's show is. So like and share the feed, guys. Uh, check us out if you're watching us over there on social. And we've got a grand prize. Pay attention. We'll be asking something about today's show. We're going to be giving away. What are we giving away today? Crush City. Crush City, baby. Crush City. Uh, the new Crush City baits are out. Uh, you get all five. Everybody's talking about Oh, it. man. You're going to get all five of the new shapes uh, out by Crush City. These, these are two of them. That's a prize pack? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I want to win. <laughs> I'm getting in, I'm getting involved in this one. All right. Eh. No, <laughs> you better pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to give a shout out to Corey that he said this is his first time being off during a Bash U live. He's watched every one of them. He's happy to be here. Awesome. Welcome, nice. Corey. Yeah. Good to have good to have you with us. It's raining cats and dogs in a lot of places Oof. around the country. Snowing uh, up at Jay Curate's house. And, uh, you said his name right. <laughs> <laughs> I said it right, but I didn't spell it right. Did you see how I spelled it right there? Rich? Yeah, yeah, that's not Fan, correct. Fantastic. <laughs> that that is not correct. But we'll let it slide. <laughs> but uh, but we're um, down at uh, Bash University Studios down on Lake Hartwell. Uh, the lake is low, and uh, they need the rain desperately down there, like mm -hmm. a lot of places around the country. And it is filling up as we speak rain's coming down like cats and dogs yeah a lot of a lot of fresh mud coming in guys yeah. and if uh if you've ever dealt with that situation on the water it can be challenging um and uh we we've actually we we have a seminar with bill lowen on exactly that topic what is going on on lake hartwell and probably likely a lot of other uh lakes down in that area right now are going to be experiencing the, the same thing um, we have a seminar with Bill Owen on how to deal with exactly those situations. So go check that one out. Yeah, that, that spring cold rain coming in, it, uh, it muddies up the water. That red clay yep. comes piling off the banks and, uh, it, it makes for some of the challenging, most challenging conditions that there are. And I know a lot of guys in that, in that area are fishing right now. Uh, a lot of people in Texas are fishing right now. I see it all the time. The, the giant, uh, share lunker category fisher are being shown a great time best time of year to catch a giant and uh we are going to be in anderson south carolina which is uh one of the reasons why we have jay on with us today and as we get our audio or video fixed here the um jay is going to be one of our premier speakers at uh at 
Anderson, South Carolina. Tickets are still available uh, at all of our shows right now. Texas, guys, we're, mm-hmm. that's going to sell out first. We've just got a few left, just a couple seats left in Athens. But uh, So make sure you get over there and get your ticket. Make sure you have a seat uh, at all of our events. But we have uh, you can go on the, thebashuniversity.com. You can see the list of uh, scheduled speakers. Uh, we have David Dudley is going to be there. B-Lat is going to be with us uh, and Anderson as well. John Cruz is going to be with us. Uh, <laughs> we heard that hiccup. Josh. The, um, uh, we've got a, and you know, it's, it's a great lineup with some amazing topics that are really going to help you uh, expand your fishing. We have a blast. Sure. It's a, it's an experience just hanging out, uh, goofing around with the instructors. You can get an opportunity, get an autograph, get a picture, if you want, talk about, you know, your favorite body of water because they've all got great experience um, on on your local waterways. Uh, so and, and Anderson's a great host city. It's right there in the middle. So if you're up in Charlotte, you're you're down there in Atlanta, uh, you're over in the Chattanooga, East Tennessee area. It's all a short trip. Get over to Anderson and uh, come check out the event with us uh, this this weekend. And we are also. Man, Rich, we're getting on a plane. Everybody's traveling yeah. at Bash University starting tomorrow, and uh, we're heading to Texas to see some some interesting baits uh, yeah. that are designed for forward facing. Man, I'm I'm really excited to see them uh, because the, l- learning what we're going to learn about at this pure fishing event and kind of seeing some of these new products get released, it's going to go hand in hand with one of Jay's topics for us in Anderson, which is the shake style baits. Um, you know the the new, well, we saw everybody doing it last year on Champlain pretty much. You know, the, the shake style baits, the shad shape, um, soft plastics, um, Demiki rig, Cindy rig, whatever you want to call it, it's putting fish in the boat. And we're going to be seeing some of those new forward facing sonar design baits. And then we're going to get to learn about them a day later. So yeah. I'm stoked. There's so, so much is going on. You think that, uh, oh, the forward facing is limiting the number, the style of baits to use. And I got to be honest, it's, we're just at the beginning of, of uh, we're just at the beginning of uh, <laughs> um, me learning how to use my headset <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, of, of the baits we're going to see, right? Yeah, we're yeah. going to, we're going to see new designs mm-hmm. and, and it's going to keep changing and, and keep coming at us a lot of different yeah. ways. And I can't wait to talk to Jay about this, but uh, I've been watching, you know, we saw uh, Koyo. Uh, have the five transducers on we talked about brian schmidt what he how he's diving in heavy with forward facing this year and uh, i've been seeing a lot of uh social posts where guys are putting the the dual uh transducers forward facing transducers on their jack plate mm. uh and they're shooting them out to um uh give them a live version of side imaging yeah. so they're running the side imaging and they're still shooting out live and it's given a, a different look. So uh, a lot of guys are starting to do that this yep. year. It re- yeah, it really is getting uh, – It's the technology is never going to stop advancing. You know, that's one thing that we know, not only in fishing, just as a society. And uh, I, I find it fascinating to see the directions that it's going. So I'm yep. uh, I'm not a forward-facing sonar hater. Newsflash. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm into it. I, I, I'm interested in, in that as a search tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's fascinating. Yep. It's fascinating, uh, to see what's happening next, but, um, we're, we're going to, we're going to dive into there. I know back when, um, back when I was learning how to fish, I would consume information, uh, everything we didn't From have scroll, right? It was yeah. like written on the, written <laughs> on the wall and, and caves, you know, <laughs> just, it just shapes yeah. someone <laughs> casting. <laughs> Uh, that's not funny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. The, uh, we had we had Bassmaster magazine, and then Bass Times came out, right? Uh, which was our you know our resource uh, to to be able to f- get information and study. And I'd read them cover to cover, man. I, I'd read the ad content like I I couldn't couldn't get yeah. enough. You know, yeah. Um, I re- and one of the things, and I, I picked this up from Mike. This was a great thing that Mike uh, put together. Is he would take all of those magazines and he would like categorize them on bodies of water. Like this has an article on the Potomac 
in you know the seventies. This one had an article on Potomac, and he would get all the Bassmasters yeah. and Bass Times for a decade with articles on the Potomac River, for instance. It is and, that is next and, level stuff, and and study those articles uh, in preparation for an upcoming tournament on that body of water. Uh, just tremendous, and I I do it today. I recommend to all of my students to to do look at stuff from that perspective because as the tournaments the tournaments are great because they reveal certain things like right. maybe colors yep. or patterns and you'll see them repeated over and over again and it's like a light switch it's like ah oh, you know in the summertime you know a frog or, or flipping is a dominant weapon yep. so you know to be prepared for that uh when you're coming to a turn that's how we, we prepared for tournaments um, and and doing well in tournaments, but but even before that, it was just about studying, uh, reading everything you could read, uh, watching every single episode of of Bassmaster. Um, I'll never forget the Lake X out here watching uh, Danny Brower flip a jig mm -hmm. into bushes, and I went out and bought it, got a jig, a jig, right? I'm right. I'm just One. starting. Yep. You remember yep. your first jig, yep. your first bait in that stuff? What was and, it? Uh, I it was a striking, Same. my first jig, and uh, it was it, a bitchy flip, and it was a um, Uncle Josh pork frog. Okay. <laughs> what are these names, <laughs> Uncle Josh pork frog? Uncle That's Josh like pork frog, stuff right there. Yeah. Yeah, and I put that on, and uh, I put it on in brown and orange color. Yeah. And I flipped the bushes right out here behind me on this on Lake X. And I, I'm like, well, he tell he does this. He swings it into the bush. How am I ever going to get a bite doing donk? Just about the time you and you get that bite, and man, you set the hook and you you caught I caught my first flipping fish right out here. It's awesome, you know. So Sweet. yeah, that, that learning is key. Never stop yep. learning. Uh, that's why we built Bass University because we we provide that. Whether you're a guy like I was, like me, way back then, just learning. Uh, making your first flip with a jig, uh, or you're a guy that's uh, man like Jay and and the guys that use our product out on tour uh, to advance their fishing. Uh, it's that's that's what's going on over here at Bash U, and we're we're pretty proud of that. We're pretty proud to be one of those resources that that's what guys are doing. They're obsessing about it. They're yep. they're getting involved in it and and helping their fishing get to the next level. That's what this show's about, guys. So, uh, so we're going to take a quick break. Um, right. Is there anything else I forgot? I always forget something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's talk about what we got coming up this week on the, uh, Bass University airwaves. Speaking of uh, Bass University. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of Bass University. And we already just talked about this guy, Brian Schmidt. We're releasing this week his forward facing sonar demo. Uh, in that demo, you're going to get to see some live action, um, some uh, some fish reacting to baits on the screen. You can see how they look on the screen. You can see what color palette he runs, how he puts that stuff to work, and also get to see him catch a few fish. Shocker. He's one of the best in the world, and that's what he does. Um, and then our classroom seminar for this week is Drew Benton fishing around the spawn. This is a good one because the spawn means a lot of different things. The spawn is not just when the bass are up on the bed and they're sitting there looking at you and you're trying to psych fish and catch for them. There's a lot of different spawn factors that have have effects on on how we target and catch uh, all three species of bass. And um, Drew Benton dri dives in on this one. He goes pretty hard on uh, on the largemouth side of things and, you know, ties some things back to Lake Murray because that's, you know, he won an event there last year. But even at that event, it wasn't just a strictly bed fishing deal. It was uh, it was actively spawning fish. It was post spawn fish. It was bluegill eaters because the bluegill were also in their spawn face. So there's a lot there to un uh, to unravel. But uh, check it out. Drew's a great instructor. Um, yeah, check it out. It'll be on Bashu TV. Yeah, the that um forward facing sonar must watch if you're a guy that's wanting to get involved with this type of technology brian is killing it and he his seminar uh in the classroom about his technique for forward facing sonar was one of our most viewed mm -hmm. in 2023 we're on the water showing him in action using it so it's a perfect companion classroom and then actually on water watching this strategy Great, great uh, tools for you to get started in this 
it, going down that genre or, you know, of learning how to use it. Yep. Jay is also, are we going to play that clip now? Do you want to play his yeah, clip let's now? Do it. Uh, Jay is also one of our top 10 most viewed seminars. We talked about him as a great instructor, but he does some eye opening things with a drop shot. I know drop shot is is a tool that is very commonly yep. used, especially for young people, high schoolers, college kids just starting out. If you want to teach somebody how to catch fish, their first fish, man, the drop shot is a great it way is to a go. Powerful weapon. Jay takes it to the next level, and he's not only catching numbers, but he's winning major tournament competitions with it. Has some very very unique techniques that he's using to do it, and he's. What number was he? Uh, I think he was number eight, number eight on number the top 10 most viewed seminars at Bashu, um, at Bashu for the year 2023. So so we're yeah. we're going to play a quick clip of that, take a commercial break right after that. And we'll uh, we'll see you here with Jay live right after fishing for a smallmouth with a drop shot. I do not let the bait sit very long, maybe 10 seconds at max once it hits the bottom. When it hits the bottom and I see a fish follow it down to the bottom, I hold it there for a second. I'll maybe give it a couple of shakes. I'm sure you guys see all the Japanese guys nowadays. You know, they sit there and shake it for three minutes. That's not me. I can't sit there for five minutes in one cast. And, you know, I constantly have to be looking, seeing what's around me and things like that. So I let it go to the bottom, let it sit there. Okay, you let it sit there for max 10 seconds. What I'll do instead of reeling it into the boat right away and making another cast, I'll reel it in as fast as I can, like 15 yards, and then I'll open up my bail again. You're bas basically what that's doing is you're doing another cast. If you think about it, if, if you're going to cast in the same, say you're going to cast in the same direction right at this camera I'm looking at. So you cast in that same direction. Okay, you're going to reel your bait in to make another cast but you're just gonna come up short. You're gonna come up short to where you just landed, so you are making another cast. What I'm doing is basically just reeling my drop shot in, opening my bail instantly, and I've made, I can make three, four, five casts in one cast, if that makes sense. The leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for. Catch more fish. Have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. Is the sensitivity of the rod. That are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod i found that can withstand my hook set. Boom, goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together. The One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Welcome back, guys. If you can't make our classes this year, we've got an amazing Crush City promotion going on right now. Uh, check it out. You're going to get a pack of each one of the new shapes. This is the cleanup crawl right here. Um, just an unbelievable flipping bait. Justin, is, what's the promotion? You get all five new packs of uh, the Crush City baits, and you get a bash you had on top of that. So I'm signing pretty, up. Pretty good yes. deal there. Resigning up. Rapala's been putting out some pretty cool, uh, like underwater 
videos on on socials uh we've been reposting them if you want to see how the actions are on some of these baits they're they're pretty sweet we saw firsthand with the brocco bug yeah 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 that's Fish right catcher. that's right my my uh flipping and pitching seminar that we just filmed uh is going to be released soon um featuring featuring that flipping bait yeah so what do we what else we got who's who's watching over on social justin uh we got chuck fish watching rich hunt uh we got Corey and randall watching and coach what's up and, guys uh, coach yeah we got a good question here on uh on youtube from chris he uh rich let, let's see what your answer is for this right. his, his question is is there any fish being new going to be at walmart i just want i am curious if there is yeah so we actually <laughs> we actually have worked with uh with brian new before um he, he did an amazing sight fishing seminar for us and uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that he talks about is <laughs> applicable for for that whole southern region of the country and um yeah brian new's a great angler an awesome instructor and uh yeah check him out at walmart not uh, at everywhere, <laughs> everywhere, everywhere you name it. So. Yeah, I think you answered his question. There. Yeah, yep. well, yes, sir, we appreciate that question. Yes, thank you for watching. We're not sure uh, if we answered it correctly, but thanks for getting after it, Rich. Yep. But appreciate it. Appreciate all you guys watching, hanging out with us. And um, we have with us now one of one of the youngest, most talented anglers on in professional angling and uh, great Bash University instructor, Colin. Call, calling in from the frozen tundra somewhere up north uh we've got jay secured how you doing buddy i'm good how are you guys doing man we're good we're good we're uh we're a little bit warmer than you we're not getting snow down here but uh you guys what's it, it it's zero degrees up there what's it looking like yeah we uh we're getting a pounding today the uh the pounding we were waiting for all year uh we're not supposed to get as much as south of here. They're supposed to get like a foot or snow or so. But up here we're getting, you know, six inches probably roughly. So everybody's kind of just hunkered in for the day for the most part. Um, but, yeah, we've had a, a pretty mild winter for the most part. So this is this is nice to, you know, this is our first real snowstorm and it's January 9th. Yeah, it's been, it's been light. Uh, we're up north too relatively speaking and uh we haven't had snow for a couple of years it's yeah. been crazy but uh have you ever been down south in like uh when the snow comes and experience that no i have not no <laughs> oh like how far south like yeah. yeah well you know like down in texas when we had right. the ice storm oh, yeah, yeah, we've yeah. been in Alabama. well yeah i mean i will say there's been times where i'm driving down south and the conditions aren't ideal and there's nobody on the roads except for like three cars or something not even salt trucks not even yeah, right. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. the problem yeah it, it's not a panic like that up at your house is it it's like ah oh, it's snowing again right yeah right pretty much yeah all the down south the the you can't find bread or milk for like a thousand miles it's all gone <laughs> it's uh you know, but they don't have the facilities like they do up north mm -hmm. but it's all it's a whole different experience I think Texas might need to uh invest in that a little bit because it seems like it's like the last few years it's happening every year down there they're getting yeah. these ice storms and snow yeah. and big cold or whatever yeah. and you know not to get grim here but it doesn't turn out very well for them yeah well you're a good driver thank goodness we were in Shreve. we're going to be back in shreveport this year for the first time in several years but that's the other place we had an ice storm in Shreveport, in Shreveport, Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, we, no kidding. you know, we got lucky getting all of our speakers in and out. This is even <laughs> before your time, Jocelyn, but we were, we were there. We had a, yeah, just another massive ice storm, but right now they're getting pounded by rain. They're getting, uh, just heavy, heavy rain coming into a body. Well, Let's hope that know. it just stays rain. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, hopefully it will for us. I know we're going to Texas and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be relatively mild. We're leaving this week to get down there and swing over to uh to you and um uh, i almost said athens and Anderson. Anderson, south carolina but jay you you're phenom right you gotta accept that you know you're out there crushing it you made it to the elites you won uh how, how did you do that man how did you, how were you able to jump the learning curve like you you saw Rich talk about me reading the ancient scrolls is how I learned how to how to how to bass fish. 
how in the world at such a young age, like what, what were the, what were some of the first steps you took to, to get good at this sport? Man, it's, I could try and break it down. I mean, it's a long process for kind of, you know, it seems short because I'm such a young age and all this happened in the last two years. Um, but I feel like most of it started when I was, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. Um, when I got out in the boat for the first time, I competed in my first tournament. Um, you know, that was at the time where technology just started to come out. Like that was at the time where, you know, the side imaging just started to become, you know, as good as it, you know, not as good as today, but you know, it was prevalent at the time. And, you know, it was also the time where, you know, I was just focused on catching fish and I didn't care you know, what species of fish it even was, you know, at, you know, back way back when I loved to catch Northern Pike, that was like my favorite nice. species to catch. Um, you know, it didn't really matter to me, you know, what I caught or what I was fishing at the time. It was a little bit later in life where I started to, you know, learn that I could, you know, make money bass fishing, doing this, you know, for a living. Um, my dad obviously fishes for walleyes for a living. So I tried to follow in his footsteps, but, um, whenever we'd go out, we'd fish bass together. Um, and a lot of it was just from, you know, fishing the local river by my house or any shore fishing spot, you know, that I had a chance to get out and fish any day of the week, whether it was, you know, two hours after school before it got dark, three hours after work when I would get home when I was a little bit older, you know, 17, 18, um, even when I didn't have a boat at the time, because I didn't actually have my first boat until I was, you know, 18, 19 years old. And at that time, it was just a small little 17 foot boat um, that we took out on the river, um, you know, and then, and then at that time, I didn't really have a vehicle to pull it. So it was a long process. I feel like a lot of what I learned came from being on the water, shore fishing, um, you know, just being in, you know, where fish are going to be, you know, whether it was the river, I was fishing these current breaks, the river would change, you know, weekly, it would go up two feet, it would come down a foot, it'd be super low. Um, and I'd fish those same spots every year. And that's when I slowly, you know, started to realize, you know, what these fish do on a daily, um, when the water level changes or the water temp changes, or, you know, what time of year, there, it was always a thing, you know, around here where the winter time's coming, right? And now it's January, we can't really bass fish. But two months prior to this, it was like, you know, the water's getting super cold. Like, where can I go to catch a bass when the water is, you know, 38 degrees in central Wisconsin? Like, that was always like a goal to me was to go out and try and figure that out. And I feel like that's kind of how where I came from and where I started to learn was mostly just, you know, being on the bank, you know, any chance I could get take on the boat. If you have a friend that wants to take you out on the boat, um, any chance you can get, that's kind of where I came from. So just fishing, um, yeah. fishing a lot, but, but fishing with a mentor, like your, your dad is known as a, a professional walleye guy. Um, man, that, that had to help as a mentor, mm -hmm. even though it's a different species than you're chasing. Uh, but the, the, you know, the behavior of things in nature and, and, uh, the fishing mentorship that came from your father, that, that had to be very helpful. Yeah. So that's when things started to change more towards my dad, you know, when I started to get serious in it, when I was a little bit older, um, that's when he would start teaching me, you know, the electronics part of it, um, you know, reading mapping, reading site imaging, reading, you know, 2D sonar, learning how to, you know, run a trolling motor, learning how to position the boat properly. Um, all those things, you know, you can learn those on your own, but if you can have a two or three day tutorial on, how to position the boat in a three mile an hour current. It's a big um, deal. You know, chances are you're going to have a head start on a lot of other people that, you know, hadn't had that chance to do that. So that was a huge help for me. And then, you know, on top of that, um, him teaching me the mental side of fishing, because I got to see it all through him. You know, I got to see the, the bad tournaments. I got to see the good tournaments. I got to see, you know, him going through the times of, you know, I've been on the water with him when he's practicing and not catching fish or doing that sort of thing. So I got to see those, you know, progressions of, you know, him go, coming up to win a tournament or not doing so well. So it was a little bit easier. And I would say, I guess maybe not easier, but it was a little more 
stress-free on my mind, knowing that you can have a bad day on the water and it happens, you know, very often, especially when we're chasing these fish around and you don't know where they're at. Interesting. The mental side is you, you learn that. What did you, what stands out? Like, um, how to overcome a bad day or, you know, stay yeah. engaged or what, what, what stands out in your mind is those mental lessons. I would say, you know, losing a key fish um, would be one huge step in or, you know, mentally on the water, let's say, you know, you're having a bad day um, and then you lose a key fish. Like how do you adjust, you know, from that loss? Are you just going to let that fish that you just lost ruin the rest of your day? Yeah, that, gonna... that's normally what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, but I mean, I feel like that's you got that jig, Pete. <laughs> that, yeah, that's that you're absolutely right. And not letting it ruin your day, or you, oh, you got to overcome that. And, you know, there was times where I think it was my rookie year on the Elite Series where there was times where it was like, you know, my first year fishing it that I'm fishing against all these names that I've looked up to my entire life. And, you know, I, there's been multiple times where I lost, you know, four or five pound fish. And it was like, I don't know how I'm going to come back from this because, you know, the body of water we're on, we're not getting a lot of bites. Um, you know, I just know the nature of the game, but you just have to put that stuff behind you. Uh, you know, there's a lot more casts to make. There's a lot more, you know, places to fish. Um, but yeah, it, it can get to you. And then, I think that's what he taught me was just don't let all these little things get to you and just focus on, you know, you're there to beat the fish. You're not there to beat, you know, the 99 or hundred other guys that you're competing against. Man, that's, that's excellent training uh, on the mental side of it because you can spin out so easily. Uh, do you have anything that you do in particular to shake it? Like, uh, do, do you say anything or do you, uh, you know, like Ike, Ike tends to break something and then he yeah. can move on, you know, that works. Yeah. I wouldn't say, favorite? I wouldn't say I'm a breaker of anything or get to <laughs> get to uh, crazy in the boat. I would just say, you know, I might sit down for a little bit and just tie a new bait on or tie whatever I was fishing with on. Maybe if I lost the fish on a jig, I'll tie a new jig on. Uh, maybe a little superstitious of it or something. Um, yeah. But for the most part, it's going to be in the back of my mind. I mean, there's no doubt if you lose a giant fish. Um, but yeah, I feel like just mentally resetting, fishing a new area always helps me quite a bit. Um, you know, you always go past the same spot, you lost the fish and you, and then all of a sudden it pops back in your mind. You're like, oh, I just lost this. I mean, uh, right here, like he was right there, you know, like maybe just go somewhere else down the lake and, Yep. you know, figure out, you know, a different, you know, figure out what that fish was sitting on or something similar. It's that's, you know, it's very good uh, recommendation there. And I wonder, Rich, are you ever going to let me, are you ever going to forgive me for losing that fish? No, that jig fish? no. I mean, it was probably a nine pounder. So <laughs> I, never, Pretty sure. I never heard this story. No. Oh, you didn't hear this story? No. Okay. Well, so Pete and oh, I fished it. Uh, no problem. I got you. <laughs> Pete on, and I huh? fished a tournament uh, a few, few years ago on the bay in, right. in the fall. And I mean, I got to say, Pete was prepared for this one. Changed out every single treble hook That's on all right. his crankbaits. All the all the swivels, the snap swivels. You know what the one thing he didn't do, Justin? Retie that retie jig. that jig that he's been guiding <laughs> with for the last three weeks. <laughs> uh, uh, oh. Yeah, that was that was rough. Right out of the gate, <laughs> right yeah. out of the gate. First, first thing in the morning, first stop, big fish swimming off. Pow! <laughs> so did it did it snap off right when you set the hook? Or yeah, did it, oh, it, did. it did. Well, you know it it set the hook rod right bowed below, real yeah. good yeah, yeah you know it, it had that position that you know yep. it's like all right this is a six pounder probably yep. Yep. and you turned uh, around to get the net and then you turned back around again and and just line hanging around and uh, yeah. yep yeah and, and i have gotten over it mentally but rich still is not recovered <laughs> from from it but one of the hardest things in the world to get over and jake yeah. one of one of the i like i've fished with uh kvd and and uh one of the things I, I learned from him is how he keeps his composure in that environment so well. And, uh, the, uh, you know, the mantra kind of is, you know, all right, I was able to trigger a strike from a big fish today. And I know how to, I know how I did that. So I'm going to have a good shot at doing that again. 
right? So you kind of switch that negative into that positive mindset where, all right, I know how to do it now. And, you know, let me go. I got a lot of time left. Let me go try to get another one. Mm -hmm. I got a, I got a question for, uh, for, for you guys, Jay and Pete, particularly what is hard and Jay, you go, you go first. Cause you have experience on these two in the last two years. What is harder to overcome losing a three pounder on the Sabine river <laughs> or losing a four and a half pounder on Lake Champlain? Oh, losing a three pounder on the Sabine. Yeah. Um, the only reason I say that is I never even caught a three pounder there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I, I'm, I'm curious about that. Cause like, that's, yeah, the, the, at Champlain, like the weights are so stacked, right? And those getting those slightly better than average fish are so important. And it's, I, but at the Sabine, you're you're only getting six bites a day, and if one yeah, of those, I would say a three pounder on the Sabine is your difference maker fish. Like I understand a four and a half pounder on Champlain is it? It's a difference maker as well, but there's a lot more four and a quarter to four and a half pound fish on Lake Champlain than there are a three pound large mouth on the Sabine, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Like I can get over losing a four and a half pounder on Champlain because, you know, at the end of the day, I, I could have three or four more opportunities at four and a half pounders where I just fished the Sabine for eight days and never had a three pound bite. So <laughs> that's an easy answer for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a unicorn. So yeah, you lose it, it's a game changer over there, that's for sure. And four and a half pounders on Champlain are hard to get, but they're not that hard to get. There's a right. lot of those. Right. So uh you can re you can recover from that one, but maybe uh, if you would have said like a six pounder, then then we would have been like, uh, six pounds, yeah, right, mouth, right. three pound large mouth. That would have been a better debate. Have you ever lost a fish like that, Jay? Have you ever lost like a unicorn on at a big moment on the elite? Um, no, I can't say I have yet. Um, I mean, I've only been fishing in the elites for a couple of years now, so I haven't had a moment where I lost like a 10 pounder or anything crazy like that. I have lost, um, I think the biggest fish I lost and it was actually the worst tournament of my career, um, so far was at, um, Lake Fork and was it my rookie year or it was one of my worst finishes. Um, if it wasn't my worst, I lost like an eight pounder that broke me off on a drop shot, um, mm -hmm. on the first day of the event. Um, and I, that whole practice period and that whole tournament, um, it was just awful for me. I don't know what the whole deal was with the lake. It was just the way it was fishing the practice I had, I knew I was going to be struggling day one. Um, and then I lost that huge fish and I knew it was going to cost me the cut. Um, that sucked. I'm not going to lie. I did catch a six pounder later that day, but it wasn't enough to, uh, just the, the weights that the, you know, the guys were catching in that tournament, you know, I had 15 pounds and was in whatever place. Well, I, in, I, it hurts so bad other than the fish that rich distracted me and I broke off huh. with him, yeah. but I, I blame rich now for that one. The, uh, I, I lost the unicorn one time. And uh, that I can remember vividly, it was on Bugs Island, Kerr Reservoir in the fall where, where nine or 10 pounds is going to get you in the top 10, nine or 10 pounds a day. And I had a, a legitimate 10 pound bass <laughs> under, under a dock on a shaky head. I skipped under there and I set and it was a shallow water situation. So you know how they'll come right at you, Jay, like in that shallow water. So I'm, I've got a spin around and I'm burning as fast as I can to keep catch up to this fish. He gets halfway back. To, he's out from under the dock. I, I survived that. And he turns sideways and stops. And now I'm bowed up and I didn't, and I'm like, Oh man, what do I got here? I haven't seen him yet. And he completely jumps out of the water. I mean, total breach. The whole fish is right. It's like 20 feet away from me. And the shaky head goes flying. He pops his mouth open, the shaky head goes flying, uh, and it was it was a t in the in that double digit range, which is an absolute unicorn, wow. and would have catapulted me into probably leading that tournament. Right. Instead, I missed the money, as the tournament oh. turned out. Like it was it was one of those crazy fish loss that you you just can't you can't overcome that. that you know? That's 
yeah, that's like the Sabine three and a half pounder. It's just right. when that fish goes away, it ain't coming back. No, you know that week. But uh, hey, we're 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 in the new year, Jay. It's happy New Year to you. And uh, and I wonder, we had our New Year's resolution show uh, last time. Do you have any in fishing? Are, are is there any techniques or strategies or things that that you're taking on for your own? education this year yeah I drill actually, 25 feet of water well yeah so that's one i <laughs> if anybody knows me or knows my fishing strengths i'm not a huge hydrilla grass fishing fan specifically <laughs> we're talking more you know not super shallow hydrilla but the deep stuff like the 20 foot of hydrilla lake seminole style really that's just, nah that's just not me but actually i do have one bait here um I'm leaving for Toledo Bend next week. And this is one lure that I personally don't think I've ever caught a bass on. And it's a football jig. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's kind of like my New Year's resolution is to knock their lights out on a football jig for the first time in my life. Um, that's awesome. I've, we don't really have the places to do it, I guess. Um, you know, up here, we don't have like the, those Southern reservoirs like Toledo where they group up offshore, you know, on those hard spots and stuff like that. And those Creek channels and, you know, those things. So that's one thing I want to get better at. Um, I know it catches big fish and yeah. That's awesome. That's a great, well, the great part about that is it's notoriously a tournament winner and a big fish catcher so it's a great technique to really uh expand on and yeah. uh, I, I didn't know if you followed the opens this year but the uh the the young the kids that made it well two of them stick out in my mind jt tompkins and tyler williams are both throwing like a yeah. three-quarter ounce football head mm -hmm. all, fishing it off of their forward facing and uh really dominated the opens this year with that technique yeah, so that was something that I was like, you know, never get to mess around with. I, I kind of have my tried and true, you know, techniques. I, I'm not the guy to really, you know, expand too much on these crazy things or whatever. So I figured that was a good one to try out. You know, now that I'm in the, the pre-practicing period and it's not, you know, official practice or anything, catch some nice fish on it and get some confidence in a new lure. Oh. What, what else are you doing? Like, what, what is it, the off season look like for you? Are you, do you, uh, do you travel and like scout the waters? Do you, um, you know, work on other techniques? I know you're frozen up there, so there's not much you can do at home. So actually, um, uh, we've had this mild winter, um, about a week ago, I got out on the boat, um, on a little lake by our house actually for the first time. Gosh, it was the craziest thing we've ever seen but the water was like 33 degrees um and i ended up catching a couple smallmouth in 33 degree water um basically almost january in wisconsin so that was a first for me um pretty crazy That's to awesome. do that um but for the most part no a lot of uh, i've been rigging the boat getting it all ready to go uh, doing that whole deal i got everything rigged on it just got to get the tackle in it um obviously tying on you know new baits that i want to get confidence in for this year um, stuff I've never, never used before or need to catch some more fish on. And then uh, obviously I'll be with you guys this weekend, uh, down in Anderson. And then next week I'll leave for Toledo and do some pre-practicing. And then I'll probably stop on fork as well. Um, on my way home since our next events right there. Uh, I like to go to places that I've never been to, or feel like I need, you know, a little bit of help on where, you know, even if it's just three or four days of graphing or, doing something like that. So I felt like Texas was a good one for me to go pre-practice, um, which is probably the only one I'll go pre-practice this year, just because the way the schedule is set up for me. And it does your, is that what your pre-practice is like? Is just, do you fish much or is it all behind the, the sonar? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to fish, no doubt. I've been itching to get out here quite a bit for the last couple of months. So I'm definitely going to fish if I find some fish, you know, graphing. But the first day or the first couple of days will be spent doing a lot of looking um, and just trying to figure out, you know, what stage of fish are in, um, how they set up, you know, whether it's with the forward facing or, 
you know, the shellfish too, because we're going to be there end of February. So it's kind of an in-between period. I'm, I've kind of been, I've been doing a lot of research recently, um, doing a lot of homework, trying to figure out, you know, cause it's, it's just kind of an odd time of the year where it's like, it could get warm really fast and those fish could pull up <clears throat> or is it still going to be the offshore deal? So I've been going back and forth trying to figure that out. How's that? How, wh <clears throat> what are you researching? How are you doing that? It's all mostly, <clears throat> it's mostly all YouTube and just online research. I mean, recent tournaments, um, you know, short YouTube videos, any little, anything I can get my hands on really just to see, you know, what's going on at that. There's a lot of, um, nowadays there's a lot of like fishing reports people will put out, um, for certain times of the year. So you can see the water temps. Um, you can see, you know, obviously the lake levels, um, do all that sort of deal. So that's generally what I'll do. I'll look at, um, another thing I re I'll really look at is like top baits from recent tournaments that time of the year. It just gives me an idea of, you know, for a guy that lives in Wisconsin all year and has fished Toledo Bend once in his life and has never been there in February, I can go and look at the top baits from a tournament that was there the first week of February and kind of get an idea of what I need to have tied on. I mean, you don't want to be going to the lake with, you know, a couple spooks and a buzzbait and it's the end of February and they're not, you know, up shallow eating, whatever, doing whatever. So that helps me a lot. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of good information on, on YouTube and things like that, that just help you get a little bit of an idea of what's going on on a lake. And um, as far as, you know, where to fish on the lake and you know what areas to look at um that's all you know based on map study and what i look at um the general lake that i think is going to play the best you know i know toledo the lower end of the lake is obviously cleaner um there's two major creek arms that always you know used to be the deal um just kind of common knowledge from back in the day so i'll probably spend time you know on both ends of the lake and, you know, just get a feel for what it looks like, you know, what I like to do. I do like to fish shallow as well. So maybe I'll go, you know, up in some creeks and look at that deal. But I do know the water's low as well. Um, so maybe that will play into a factor, you know, on how I look at areas, you know, if the water were to come up a couple feet. That's, uh, you know, finding those, those you know, real-time conditions is much so much easier now than it ever used to be. Right and following things along we should just watch the weather patterns and mm -hmm. and and hope that we could you know make make educated guesses on things yeah you know? but another, yeah another thing i do too is like for the time of the year we're going there like you can look at weather from last year so i'll go back and look at you know the weather from 2023 in february yeah. you know it looked like about the time the tournament started last year is about the time you know that texas kind of hit that break where it was like lows in the thirties, lows in the thirties, lows in the thirties, and all of a sudden lows in the mid forties, lows in the mid fifties. And then, you know, high 75, 80 every day, um, you know, for a couple weeks. So you kind of got to take that into account on how you pre-practice because you don't want to be, you know, stuck out fishing in 30 feet of water when the fish are leaving you, you want the fish coming to you during a tournament. That's me. I that's so. I never thought of that. Like looking at previous years' weather patterns. And yeah, I mean that's unpredictable, but I feel yeah. like it gives you an idea at least. Yeah. Of when it kind of breaks, you know, because there's a certain point in the year, especially here every year, there's a certain point where you know our lows go from the 30s to the 40s, and then the 40s to the 50s. It it really doesn't vary, but a couple weeks, um, you know, every single year. And, you know, you can relate it to the tournament results. Like hey, the tournament on, let's say, talk about Toledo Bend in previous year, we had a, a warming trend or we had a cold front come through, and this was the results. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see right. how the guys that won adjusted. What, what was the correct adjustment for that weather pattern? And then right. apply that to the pattern that you're going to be facing. That's, that's really, that's great intel. That's good stuff. Let me ask you this. Uh, my, my son's in the, in the high school wrestling and, um, you know, we're, you know, 
working with coaches and stuff, and and even I was talking with Rich about this. It's like uh, Rich had a great uh, uh, line. I love this one. It's like you win or you learn. That's what you're doing in a in a match like that, right? You if you if you lose that match, that's a awesome learning opportunity. And uh, I think that's so factual, so great. Let me ask you this about your fishing this year. Like, did you, were there, did you have some big learning lessons like that where, you know, things didn't go your way and, and you're able to, uh, to take, to garner some, some education from it? Oh, for sure. There was multiple times um, throughout the year. Some specific ones I can think of. Um, worst finish of the 2023 season was on Lake Seminole. Um, first day I had um, a solid bag of bedding fish found in that tournament. Um, and I also did go and pre-practice that lake as well. So I had areas that I knew of, you know, that had, you know, old beds or, you know, spawning areas that I thought could produce during the tournament. So I catch all my fish on day one, obviously, you know, everybody knows the lead series tournament's a four day tournament. You got to, you know, keep up the pace. Um, it was more of just a dumb decision by me to kind of go back and try and explore and find more fish in the area that I already caught my fish. Um, you know, there had been big fish caught there, but I didn't know how many of them were actually left. And, you know, I kind of knew going into it, I was going to be picking and scraping for what I had that day. Um, and looking back on it, um, I had two or three other areas that I knew of in the back of my head from pre-practice that I knew fish were going to spawn on because I saw old beds there. Now the fish were not there in official practice of the, of the tournament. So this is, you know, two, three days prior to day one of the tournament, there was no fish there, but I knew, you know, the lake was warming up, things were happening. Um, you know, I had found these fish just the day before the tournament that I caught on day one. Um, and I was a little late to those areas that I had in the back of my mind um, on day number two. I got there, you know, noon, one o'clock. And, you know, lo and behold, I pull into those areas that I had in the back of my mind. And, you know, there's two or three of the guys that were, you know, up in the leaderboard. You know, they had already caught all the fish there that, that were there for that day. Um, so I feel like it's just small things like that. And it's just me being stubborn and going back to things I know and not, you know, fishing free for the most part. Um, I feel like that's a big thing. You just have to fish free um, fish areas that you don't know have fish, but in the back of your mind, um, you know, it's right. And you should just go there and just do it off firsthand rather than going back to an area that, you know, you're just going to be, you know, kind of just picking up scraps for the most part. That's, that's great. That's a great lesson. And it's weird that when you win a tournament, you don't learn nearly as much as when, right. you, yeah, really. you know, much. it's, it's true. And, uh, and, uh, I, John Soka was just on with us and he's got a great, um, line that I've used and, and I've adopted it is, is never take practice out of your tournament. Mm -hmm. And, and I love that, you know, it's, it's like, like it, it's basically what you're saying. Fish yeah. Free. Yeah. There was one other moment too. Um, it was actually at the St. Lawrence where I won um, the previous year. So we go back. I had a really good area found. Um, I caught them there very well the first day. Um, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was, it was good fishing. I mean, I had, you know, a good weight in a short amount of time, uh, left them biting. I go back there on day number two. Um, and right off the bat, like my third cast of the day, I catch a five pounder. Um, so automatically I'm like, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is going to go like day number one win. I mean, I can see them. They're around. I just got a five pounder. And lo and behold, it's like 11 o'clock and I only got three fish in the live. Well, you know, two of them are three pounds. One of them's five pounds. Um, so I go and hit some other areas, um, you know, that I have in the back of my mind. Uh, that are close by to this one other area and not catching any good fish. I mean, for the St. Lawrence standards, you know, two to three and a half pound fish are not what you want. Um, I have all those in my live well and it's not working. Um, but at the same time, you know, this was a day where it was calm. 
Um, you could run around the lake. You could do all sorts of things. But it was just me being so stubborn trying because I knew the fish were there. I mean, the fish were there um, to potentially make a top 10 in this area. Um, but I could not get them to react and bite, which was one of the most frustrating things I think I've ever seen on Lake Ontario. But um, looking back on that day too, like if I just say screw it and just run out in the middle of the lake, which is what I ended up doing on day number three, um, I would have been in a lot better position. And it was just a, just a small little learning lesson by me. Just, you know, you don't need to be forcing fish to bite um, when you have the entire lake on a calm day um, like that. It's just, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of goes back to not having situations. You know, yeah. It, it goes back to not having a lot of experience on the lake either. Um, like, I don't know the lake like the Johnsons do or some other guys. So like, I'm not going to run all the way out to the ducks, you know, not knowing and not ever having been out there, you know, in the month of August. Um, you know, that's just kind of the risk I was kind of taking fishing my area, but looking back on it, you know, that's actually where I ended up going on day number three. And of course, you know, they're out there biting and it was kind of a dumb decision by me, but it's a, it was a good learning lesson. That that is uh boy that's a tough one because what you're talking about is intimidating you know yeah. going out to the d ducks I know the area I mean yeah it's, right. it's gonna it's, drive off the e edge of the earth yeah when you look out across that lake yeah you're like I'll go to the ducks you get to yeah. the ducks and yeah. like a few hours later and it's the size of Wisconsin that's, you know yeah that's kind of what I felt like kind of you know put me down to not do it uh, during the yeah. time because it's like. I mean, you're going, I mean, you're making a, if, if you go all the way out there and you don't catch anything in the first hour, I mean, your, your day is pretty much done. Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty much it for you. So it was kind of like stay in my area. Hopefully I can catch, you know, whatever it is or go out there and, you know, catch 22 pounds. Yeah. That's a tough, that it's a great learning lesson. What did, have you, given any thought to why those fish that you were on weren't biting? Do you think it was a lack of current or what do you, what do you think was freaking those fish out? Uh, so no wind, no wind was the number one mm -hmm. lack of current. Yeah. It was in practice. Uh, the wind had been blowing into this area pretty well <clears throat> and they were pretty loaded up in there. I mean, there was Day a one. You guys had wind. Yeah, we had some wind and there was some pretty good current coming into that area. It had them set up pretty good, um, but the fish never left. That's that's the thing that um, now there wasn't as many fish as there was there in practice, but there was still plenty of fish there to have, you know, a really good bag. And for whatever reason, um, I think a lot of it too is it's kind of an area that on the lake that gets a lot of pressure. It's an easily accessible area, yeah. um, and it's the month of August. And I was catching these fish relatively shallow, you know, like six foot, six to eight foot in August. Um, so I felt like they were pretty, you know, they were educated. They weren't, right. they weren't the ones, you know, out by the docks. <laughs> yeah. It's what's weird Sour out there. A little bit yeah. Now. Those, those river fish can get temperamental yeah. and, and uh, boy, the lake fish never seem to do that. They're, right. they're always biting out there. If you can get to I them, know. you know. Yeah, they're always biting. I, let me. This is a tool that I used, and I wonder if you do. Is uh, logs? Do you do you maintain uh, logs from your tournaments or your practice trips to help you? Um, I've thought about doing it, but personally, I don't really keep personal logs of like what I do on the lake or things like that. Um. I, I, I don't know. I'm more of the guy that likes to go out there and kind of fish the moment more, not go mm -hmm. off past history um, mm -hmm. for the most part. Cause I feel like nowadays too, um, a lot of the history you could have um, it's changing so much. Like, you know, we look at back in the day, you know what I say back in the day, but like a year or two ago, <laughs> everybody's catching, you know, winning tournaments, different ways. Now all of a sudden we're winning tournaments, you know, catching like the tournament on Seminole was one on a drop shot and 17 feet of water. Like I could have a log on Lake Seminole of how I caught bedfish, but 
Like I don't have a log of, I feel like it's a lot of it's too is lack of experience with me. Like I don't have a lot to go off of, you know, if I were to create a log, like I have, you know, I've been on 16 body or whatever it is, 18 bodies of water in the last two years fishing the elite series. Um, obviously at all different times of the year. Um, but I feel like I have a, a good memory of that. So I usually won't write it down just because I feel like every time you go somewhere and do something, it's always something different that it gets one on. And I feel like you never want to just go back to what you did last time, you know? That's, that's, that's in, an interesting perspective. And I know with all the information that's being collected now from the tournaments it's so easy to go back and find right. what the weather patterns right. were you know what the how the fish were caught the depth they were mm -hmm. caught and all those important things are are readily available a lot mm -hmm. a lot more now than they ever used to be you know right exactly but yeah I, a lot of it too is like you know i'll go out um you know on a tournament and i have a youtube video now you know of my whole day you know out there on the water so i can kind of use that as my Heck yeah. You know, kind of like how I went through the whole tournament, you know, it was kind of, you know, maybe it wasn't my practice, you know, I don't have that, you know, to my advantage, but, you know, I have my whole tournament, you know, I can watch, you know, a YouTube video or a video that I have, or, you know, all the GoPro footage that I took um, throughout the week. If, if it really comes to that point where I need, you know, something to just refresh my mind. Well, the, the, the only th Here's the thing that I that I'm starting to encounter. Like when I was your age, till I was probably in my 40s, the I remembered every fish I caught, every every single one, and uh, how it was caught, when it was caught, the the whole bit. It was like total recall. And I noticed that as I don't think it was much it, as much my age as, as as it was. I fished so many different bodies of water that I I started losing it a little bit. Like I. I couldn't remember every single thing that I wanted yeah. to, um, right. you know, so I, I found that uh, helpful to go back and look at some of those patterns and situations. Uh, but you're 20 years away from that. You're good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got time. You got plenty of time. I, you're, you're a tech guy. You're a sonar guy. Um, how many, how many uh, forward facing transducers are we running on the boat this year? I just got two. Uh, this, the same that I did last year. Um, just just up two, on, two on the trolling motor. Uh, I felt like it's pretty simple. Uh, I got, obviously I have uh, two Garmin units running, one in perspective, one in forward um, with the two transducers. And then, you know, I got side view mapping, um, just the two at the console. Um obviously three graphs up front. I just got a little 10 inch graph for mapping up front, kind of try to downsize a little bit, uh, reduce some weight at the bow. Um, but yeah, I felt like it works really good for me and I didn't see a reason to change anything up. Are you going 12s up front or are you, or are you like 16s? So last year I ran three 12s this year. I'm going to run a 16, a 12 and a 10 at got the you. bow. What are you putting on the 16? Uh, I'll have forward. Um, okay. Forward on perspective that. on the 12? Yeah. It's it. just a personal choice. I right. mean, obviously not everyone can afford to get a 16-inch graph, but if I'm going to be using it, you know, 250 days a year, I want something that I'm not squinting at. And, you know, if the sun hits it at a different angle or something, you know, you can see the screen better. Um, so, yeah. I've been I've been uh, seeing um, some of the stuff where they're running uh, like a I don't know what HDMI you call it. to a monitor to yeah, a monitor like the, that the NBT yeah that's grip. that's what I'm talking about right. the the monitors that are twenty plus inches twenty two um, yeah I, I you know I guess you're com comfortable with the sixteens what do you think about guys getting that big I guess. It looks like it'd be amazing at really isolating the fish. Yeah, my so the one I run is just the uh, the original 16 inch Garmin, uh, actual Garmin graph with the MBTs. I saw some guys were running those this year. I guess my take on the bigger screen is, I feel like the bigger you go, the less detailed it gets. Um, you know, I mean, when right. you really think about it, it's it's kind of how it works. I mean, you get 
you know, once you get to a certain point and you yeah, start going you the other direction, a point, your separation and all your little fine details of everything are, are not going to be as good as they would. So this is probably the biggest I'll ever go um, personally, just for, you know, a weight standpoint and, and just for the overall kind of configuration at the bow. I mean, I, I do like to fish shallow, so I like to flip and I don't want, you know, things all over in the way and stuff like that. Right. So. Uh, what what are your thoughts on the uh, guys running uh, on the running the transducers out the side on the uh, jack plate? I love the idea. Um, do I think it's it could help in certain situations? Yeah, for sure. Um, is it something that I would put on my boat in the future? Possibly. I mean, I'd think about it. I, I'd like to see it firsthand before I actually did it myself, just to see. Um, I mean, obviously it would be an advantage, no doubt. Um, I just don't know, you know, certain situations when it would be better than others or how it even looks when you're idling. I'm not sure um, what that even looks like, I guess, but it's a great idea. I mean, I think it's, I think it's smart of guys to do it. I mean, any advantage you can get um, to, you know, see the fish and use it to your advantage is good. You know, like everyone says, you're not going to get everyone to bite. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's getting tougher and tougher. And uh, one of the other, I mean, the complexities of that are, are, you know, amazing. Like I think about all the possible failures that can happen when you're out on the giant waves on, yeah, right. you know, the Toledo Bend or, right. or, you know, one of the big Great Lakes or something. Uh, yeah. Man, there's so much to go wrong <laughs> with the electronics. You know? Right. You, you've got to be a master. You got, Seriously. you got, you got to be able to, Deal, okay, deal with all you that be like yourself. Yeah, you, you got to be a tech wizard at the same be. time as you know worrying about your fish. And I think like everybody's probably got like that like like that money zone to where like all right, I have just yeah. enough technology on my boat to feel like I'm getting as much information as I can get without getting overwhelmed and having to be worried about everything working. And that mm -hmm. that that level is different for everybody. Yeah, that's what see. That's that's exactly where I'm at. Like if I were to put two more transducers on my boat. It just, it just kind of gets me all, you know, like, do yeah, I have to be looking at this? Do I have to be looking at this? Like, if I see something good on side imaging or whatever, like, I'm going up on the bow regardless. So, right. I mean, that's kind of where I fall in the lines of, you know, how much do I right. really need to feel comfortable, yeah. you know, out there graphing? And with, you, with, with the schedule that you guys fish, too, like, you know, you start off, you, you go – you know, Texas, Louisiana, over to Florida. Like you're not, if, if I if say, if you lived on a body of water where, where, where your deep water fish and live scope is just absolutely so important. Right. Well then, yeah, maybe I would say like everybody should be running that right. dual thing. But like, I mean, these guys are fishing so many diverse fisheries. Like they're going to be dealing with timber and then grass and then a river system. And like, it's just up and down so much that, yeah. you know, tell yeah. me the, Tell me the advantages of perspective. Uh, when, oh, when, I mean, when, yeah. when do you use that? All the time. Uh, no matter where I'm at, really, all the time. It's basically the advantages of perspective is having a live image of the bottom um, while you're fishing, um, knowing where the edge is, knowing where an isolated piece of cover is, um, I can almost, yeah, you know, I can point out multiple times where, you know, you're using forward imaging, but at the same time, say you're looking at a vertical piece of structure, or maybe it's a log that's on the bottom that only comes up, you know, six inches. Right. And, but it's a big tree, like, and it's just a singular log. I mean, you're seeing that entire log on perspective, whereas on forward, you're just seeing a little blimp of it on the bottom. Right. Um, so there's I mean, first a lot of times where they go hand in hand, really. I mean, yeah. forwards for, you know, things that are off the bottom, um, perspectives for things that are laying flat on the bottom. Um, it's basically, it's basically just shooting a picture of side imaging, but in live time. And that's my best opinion of it. How, how shallow are you effective with, uh, I, Cause I keep hearing about that, you know, guys going more and more shallow finding, you know, 
their ability to catch fish out of grass clumps and, mm -hmm. and lily pad fields and really dirt shallow stuff. With both transducers? Yeah, perspective in particular seems to be okay. the better shallow water tool. Is that yeah, right? It, yeah, for sure is. I mean, you can go as uh, – the biggest thing with perspective is you have to be able to adjust your transducer um, when you get deeper or you get shallower. So when you get shallower, um, you want it up to a point, you know, as high as it gets before it blows out of the water. Um, there's a certain angle you have to go and look at it, but um, as high as you can get it without blowing out. I mean, you could fish – you know, a couple of feet of water with perspective mode um, to the point where you're basically looking at the bottom with your own eyes. Um, but then when you get deeper, obviously it's vice versa. The transducer just goes down. Um, that's where it gets a little bit touchy, you know, past that like 15 foot mark, it gets a little tougher um, to start seeing, you know, detailed things farther out. Um, but for the most part, I mean, if you're out there in 30 feet of water, um, you're probably going to be using your forward facing. Well, I'm going to be diving into that this year. Uh, I, I continue to dive in and learn more and more and get better with it uh, myself. But I, uh, I love that you're taking on a football um, head as your, you know, your yeah. weapon of choice. I, <laughs> I, I want to be so bold. I got to give you some homework. Okay. Are you ready? Are you yeah. ready for your homework? Yeah. Uh, we've got. Brandon Polinick, uh talking about how he uses the football head jig, his seminar go. on Bash University. Brian Thrift, Mike Iconelli. Uh, we've got three of the premier anglers on the planet uh, talking about their tactics and, and uh, how they fish that football head jig on structure, various other things. So uh, there, it's snowing outside. Go check yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> awesome man i appreciate you coming and hanging out with us man i'm looking forward i'll see you in a couple days yeah yeah sounds good i'll be getting out of here at least for a little while yeah yeah hopefully uh it'll be a little bit warmer down there it'll be great to have you back in class at bash U, and uh we'll see you then and and of course we'll all be watching this year out on the elites and uh wish you all the best buddy i oh, appreciate it guys thanks for having me on oh thank thanks, you guy. Jay Secure, um, man, one of the, you know, most effective young anglers on the planet. Um, and you can see I was diving into the the details. Yeah. Uh, but you know what I like about him? He has, you know, it just occurred to me. He's got that that Jordan Lee demeanor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like un, uh, seemingly unflappable. Right. Like it, it just. It's like it's coming easy. Like nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna get in the way of you making your way into the winter circle. Right. Uh, it just seems to really be like that. Just talking to them, just laid back, easy, and uh, unflappable. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we got to keep a uh, keep a level head. It's something that uh, I think everybody can can learn from. You and know. Now they're going to go head to head again. Yeah. Uh, with Jordan coming back to the elites this year. Yeah. So uh, two cool customers, two youngsters. Well, of course, Jordan, I, he is still a youngster, but uh, he's got probably 10 years experience uh, out on tour now. Uh, it's hard to believe. And he only, it took him four years and he won two classics. Uh, four years on tour. Crazy. Craziness, guys. Well, awesome. Uh, awesome interview, guys. Come hang out with us down at Anderson. Look at the other shows. Uh, come come see us. It's worth the trip. By the way, after after the Athens uh, event, we're going to have a Bash U meetup. We're going fishing at Lake Athens. Mm -hmm. Kate's going to be there. Uh, She's hopefully. so sad. Don't do that to her. <laughs> she wants to go to Texas. <laughs> oh, I, we, we, you should come. We got a seat for you, Kate. We will leave. We will leave a special seat for you there. You and Jocelyn can go catch your first share lunkers uh, down there on Lake Athens. But we're gonna we're gonna have a blast. Um, get your tickets. That class, I'm telling you right now, I think there's like ten seats left. Yeah. So uh, now that Kate's coming, there's only nine. <laughs> uh, but uh, gonna see a Longhorn. Yeah. Don't yeah. worry. She'll be with the Longhorns. <laughs> <laughs> Same. That's not what well, we're going to get. Texas barbecue, maybe Texas some barbecue, crawfish. mimosas, share <laughs> <laughs> lunkers, uh, crawfish and share lunkers, uh, brother. We're
what could be what, what I'm talking about? What could be better? Um, going to be a lot of fun. Uh, guys, come come join us. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Yeah. Like and share well, the feed over on yep. social. We actually got a uh, one of our instructors uh, wanted to, you know, send us something a little uh, unique for the show. What? Uh, yeah. Should yeah. we play it now before commercial? Yeah, let's play it before the play it and then <laughs> roll into the commercial. All right. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Outside is nasty, and you're looking for something to do. There's a Bass University study with me this weekend. <laughs> the leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for. Catch more fish. Have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick, every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I found that can withstand my hook set. Boom goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minkota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together. The One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. All right, and we are back. We so, are we are back. What do you got? Grand uh the trivia question. I'm putting it in the chat board right now. In the chat. If you in haven't, we we put the trivia question in the chat board. It's written. First one to get the correct answer, uh Here we is go. gonna 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 win our grand prize. Pull of Crest City Baits. What's the question? Jay lost an eight pound fish on Lake Fork. Uh, the year he won Bassmaster Rookie of the Year. What was the bait slash setup he lost it on? Now I could just guess that one. Yeah, you could. You could you know, if you know Jay if and you, how he fishes. Yeah, if you know how he fishes. Yep, and Blake uh, Bailey won it on Blake, the drop shot, and he beat Dan Allen. Blake Dan, Bortles. Get your game up, man. man some, somebody's got higher speed internet than Dan. I can't believe it. Nice job, Blake. Nice yeah, job. Well job, done, Blake. Blake, thanks for watching, guys. And uh, we got a like and share winner. We do. Jason Grimm. Yes, thanks, Jason. Shout Appreciate out Jason. you. Appreciate you hanging out with us, guys. Uh, man, who's coming to class? Hope to see all you guys there. It's going to be uh, great. It's just a great time. Even if you're living up here, what a cool deal to come down for the weekend and, and enjoy Bash U live and hang out with a lot of people do. Tra people travel from all over. Uh, Hawaii. Or Hawaii. Not, not, not Hawaii. That's not the furthest. Aloha. Japan. We got somebody coming from Japan. Japan is the furthest that uh that a student has traveled to come to bash university that's insane so, uh, wow that's as far as it gets you'd have to live on the moon <laughs> to, wow to travel further other side of Japan. the planet the other side of the planet straight so yeah so come on drive fly get your helicopter whatever it boat. takes boat get yourself horse and buggy uh come on down to the classes we're going to be mobile Vespa. every weekend at a bash university event we're but we're going to be back Tram car next week live with another uh, Bash University uh, live, we'll recap our event. Yeah, and uh, talk about the, uh, the the next ones coming up, guys. Man, so. it's here. We're doing and it. Can't believe it. Anybody's in Tennessee and wants to hang out with me, so I'll be by <laughs> myself. Come to the East yeah, Tennessee yeah. Fishing Show. Beetle be at East That's Tennessee right. Fishing Show. I will. Show. I will. Where will you be, Ike? 
He'll be in Shreveport with us. He'll be in Shreveport. I am. Yeah. 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 Couple weeks. Everybody. Kate's making an uh, appearance in the background. Ike just flew through. Guys, thanks for watching. That's we're gonna one see, way to put it. See you next week. Yep. Before <laughs> Pete ships us off, we're going to do our sub of the week to <laughs> he forgot. Noah. Shout out Noah. Yo, Noah. Noah. Nice fish. Sure, Noah. Rocking the best you had. And he's saying have a bad day, but we're saying have a great day. That, gonna be a that bad, is a great day. Bad day for those fish That's if you're right. a Bashu member and you're out there smashing them. Speaking of what, what was the I the, speaking <clears throat> of bad days? Uh, what Bashu hat scene in the emergency room? Yes, there what, was one. What was that all about? I don't know. That might be like a HIPAA violation. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Someone in the HIPAA. ER had a BU hat on. <laughs> I, I could have well, yeah. HIPAA violation. Yeah. HIPAA. Hey, well, employee, <laughs> employee or patient? Patient. Oh. Man, well, whoever well, was. they just got good. a Rapala DT6 hook stuck in their finger. Uh, Jason yeah. said it's probably he fractured his wrist from holding up, those, up uh, those big bags. Yeah. Big well, That's a common BU problem. Yep. Well, we we hope all is well. Bash University going to be a BU problem at Lake Athens. Hope, yeah, hope you're feeling better and making your way out of there okay. Uh, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Another episode of Bashy Live. Bye.